Well, hi guys, welcome back. Uh, date today is May 8, 2017, Year of Our Savior 2017. And remember, there's only heaven and earth. We're getting close, folks, only heaven and earth. Because that's going to tie into this, because a lot of what we've been told with the Big Bang, and the, I, I didn't get into it, uh, the title of this Bible study, Bible study number 131, Creation versus Evolution, Part 3. Creation versus evolution part three. See, as we start getting into, when we get into heaven and earth, we're going to learn that a lot of this stuff with all these speeds and explosions and we're spinning and traveling through space and all this stuff, it's pretty interesting. Things that we've been told, but it hasn't proven. So now we're going to get into evolution and uniformitarianism. And I touched on uniformitarianism. I've mentioned it throughout the Bible study course uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Uniformitarianism is the philosophy of science is the assumption, the assumption that the natural processes operating in the past are the same as those that can be observed operating in the present. So what they're assuming is what's happening right now. Right now it's a beautiful sunny day outside and it's a calm breeze. It's really mellow, beautiful. So therefore, because that's happening today, they philosophize that that's what was going on thousands and thousands and millions and millions or a billion years ago. It's just the same thing going on. And so you had the wind kind of blowing really mellow and it took, you know, millions of years for it to blow and form a mountain or whatever it is. But that's uniformitarianism. The, they say that the present is the key to the past. It was originated by Scottish naturalist in the late 18th century, starting with the work of the geologist James Hutton, which was refined by John Playfair and popularized by George Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology of 1830. The term Uniformitarianism was coined in 1832 by William Wellwell, Wewell, who also coined the term catastrophism for the preceding idea that the earth had been created through supernatural means and had then been shaped by a series of catastrophic events caused by forces which no longer prevail. So catastrophism is, comes from the word catastrophic. So something catastrophic happened according to the Bible, which was the worldwide flood. Really changed a lot of things. And that's where you had, and, and of course you had the giants and the, the um, angels coming down and procreating, um, being perverted and mm -hmm. procreating with everything. And you have giants and giants are found all over the world, but it's been covered up by Luciferian governments. Yes. Oh, that sounds like a conspiracy. Folks, it is. It's the greatest conspiracy of all. It's the Luciferian conspiracy. If you're a believer, it should be pretty obvious. If you're not, I totally understand. So we see here that catastrophism. Uniformitarianism is one of the most basic principles of modern geology. This observation that fundamentally the same geological processes that operate today also operated in the distant past. It exists in contrast with catastrophism, which states that Earth's surface features originated suddenly in the past by geological processes radically different to those occurring, currently occurring. Uniformitarianism is a journalization of the principle of actualism, which states that present day processes, astronomical, geological, paleo, uh, paleo, paleoontological, I'll get it, can be used to interpret past patterns. The principle of actualism is the cornerstone of paleo uh, ecology. Paleoecology uses data from fossils and subfossils to reconstruct the ecosystems of the past. The geologist James Hutton was a pioneer of the principle, which was later popularized by Charles Lyell and influenced Charles Darwin. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, the debate between the two theories was intense since uniformitarianism seemed hard to reconcile with the prevailing religious belief of the time. Today, however, most, if not all, mainstream scientists support uniformitarianism, as do most mainstream religious denominations. And that's the, you know, they, they don't really stand on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so what we're, we're about, at the very beginning, we define what truth was, which is the Word of God, that it was inspired and preserved, and that's what we stand upon. Whether you agree with it or not, if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. This isn't about a popularity contest, folks. This is about us being true to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and standing unapologetically and, and, and believing in God. That's what we believe. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to believe in God, that's your choice. It is as you will it to be. Before continental drift was recognized in the 20th century, the surface of Earth was believed to have remained generally unchanged since its formation. Cooling from a molten state was believed to have caused shrinkage, which caused mountains and folding of the surface. Currently, it is accepted that much of the mantle is plastic and fluid, and the crust is slowly moving over it. It is this relative motion that produces folding, compression, rises, and depressions, etc. This is the uniform uniformitarian. It, it has happened over a long extended period of time. Creationism and catastrophism. Catastrophism is the truth that the earth has been affected by sudden, short-lived, violent events that were sometimes worldwide in scope. The dominant paradigm of geology today is uniformitarianism, also sometimes described as gradualism. But recently, a more inclusive and integrated view of geologic events has developed, resulting in a gradual change in the scientific consensus, reflecting acceptance of some catastrophic events. So now they're going, well, see, they can't agree amongst themselves. You know, like, well, we, we believe in uniformitarianism. Now we're like, well, you know, some of it is catastrophic, but other, other parts of it are uniformitarianism. And then you have, you know, one person has an opinion, another person has an opinion, and there you have it. Once again, conjecture. Uh, this, is, this is science today, folks. A lot of it is a religion and theory. The creationist view. Yes, the creationist view. Being uh, before uniformitarianism, the dominant belief in many cultures of the creation and development of the world was essentially catastrophism. The biblical account of the Great Flood is a prime example of these beliefs. Mm -hmm. Earth's history was viewed as the result of an accumulation of catastrophic events over a relatively short time period. It was basically the only way to understand the observations of early geologists, which believed in a short history of Earth, amen, before the 18th and 19th century. The catastrophists of the 19th century believed that God was directly involved in determining the history of the earth. Catastrophism of the 19th, 19th and early 20th centuries was closely tied to religion and catastrophic origins were considered miraculous rather than natural events. One of the key differences between catastrophism and uniformitarianism is that to function, uniformitarianism requires the assumption, the assumption of vast timelines, whereas catastrophism can function with or without assumptions of long, ta long timelines. Today, most geologists combine catastrophist and uniformitarianist standpoints, taking the view that Earth's history is a slow, gradual story punctuated by occasional natural catastrophic events that have affected Earth and its inhabitants. Creationism or creation theology encompasses the belief that human beings, the world and the universe were created by a supreme being, deity, God. The event itself may be seen as ex nihilo, Latin term meaning out of nothing, it is often used in conjunction with the term creation, as in creatu ex nihilo, meaning creation out of nothing. So God, as a creator, 
created things. Okay, that's what we see. There was a, a, a divine purpose behind why we're created. That's what's so amazing. Mm -hmm. You have this evolution. Yeah. What's the purpose of life? Why, mm -hmm. why do you think everybody's depressed? Yeah. Because they're not living a life of meaning. Amen. What's the purpose of life? Oh, materialism, I just go to shop and store and have a bunch of fun, but then you wonder why people are on Prozac and you have all this stuff going on. Um, a lot of problems going on, folks, and this is a battle. This is a supernatural battle. Understand that the Luciferians control the government. Understand that Satan is the god of this world. So we finished another chapter. But we're still in creation versus evolution. It's a very, very large subject. So we're going to continue creation versus evolution. Now we get into the Usher Lightfoot calendar. The Usher Lightfoot calendar is a 17th century chronology of the history of the world formulated from a literal reading of the Bible by James Usher, Archbishop of Ar Armagh, in what is now Northern Ireland, the chronology first published in 1650 is famously the source of the citation by many modern creationists that the universe was created by God in 4004 BC. The chronology is named for Usher as well as John Lightfoot who published a similar chronology in 1642 to 1644. The chronology is, however, arguably misnamed as it is based on Usher's work and not on that of Lightfoot, who was later the vice chancellor of Cambridge University. Usher's work, more properly known as the Annals Veritas Testamente, a prima mundi origini deducti. Uh, let's translate that. Annals of the Old Testament deduced from the first origins of the world. What amazing thing is using the Creator's Handbook to deduct and determine history. Now I know science, scientists don't like to do that today, but amazing. Now this was his contribution to the long-running theological debate on the age of the earth. This was a major concern of many Christian scholars over the centuries. Usher deduced that the first day of creation began at nightfall preceding Sunday, October 23rd, 4004 BC in the proleptic Julian calendar near the autumnal equinox, while Lightfoot similarly deduced that creation began at nightfall near the autumnal equinox, but in the year 3929 BC. Okay, so we're, we're right around that time, 4000 BC. So right now we're in the sixth day because a day is a thousand years in the Bible. So right now we're in the day six. We're in 6,000 years of creation and Jesus Christ can come at any moment. You know, it could be, you know, a lot of times every generation thinks Jesus Christ is coming. Mm -hmm. Every generation does. Like right now, I'm like, it's getting real evil real fast, folks. There is some crazy stuff. I mean, it's not just it's not just homosexuality and sodomy and pedophilia. Now it's transhumanism going on. I mean, just and downloading your subconscious. I mean, you we could go on and on and on. It's getting so crazy. But all this stuff is is the lie that you Satan is offering that you will be your own God. He's offering immortality. Mm -hmm. But he's offering it another way. another way, which is going to lead to damnation. There is only one path, one light, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So this body has to die unless he comes. But the soul lives on. So we see here that Usher proposed date of 4004 BC was not greatly different from the estimates of uh, Venerable Bede, 3,952 B.C., or Usher's near contemporary Scaliger, 3,949 B.C., it was widely believed that the Earth's potential duration was 6,000 years, 4,000 before the birth of Christ and 2,000 after, corresponding to the six days of creation on the grounds that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, 2 Peter 3, 8. I got ahead of myself. Usher's History of the Earth. Usher's chronology provides the following dates for key events in the biblical history of the world. 
4004 BC creation. 2348 BC, the Great Flood. 1921 BC, God's call to Abraham. 1491 BC, the exodus from Egypt. 1012 BC, the founding of the temple in Jerusalem. 586 BC, the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. And 4 BC, the birth of Christ. Usher's chronology today. It is by divine providence of history that Usher's chronology remains so well known, while those of Scaliger and Bede, amongst others, have slipped into obscurity. From about 1700 onwards, annotated editions of the immensely influential, yes, you got it, you guessed it, King James translation of the Bible began to include his chronology with their annotations and cross-references. The first page of Genesis was annotated with, annotated, with Usher's date of creation of 4004 BC. It was included in the widely distributed Schofield Reference Bible. Dangerous Bible, by the way, folks. Stay away from those accursed notes. More modern, uh, modern, uh, more modern translations of the Bible usually admit the chronology. Surprise, surprise, because they're Roman Catholic Bibles. But there are still many copies of the annotated King James in circulation. By the end of the 18th century, Usher's chronology came under increasing attack from supporters of, you guessed it, uniformitarianism, evolutionists, who argued that Usher's young earth was incompatible with the increasingly accepted view of an earth much more ancient than Usher's. By the time Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution, through natural selection, which assumed an ancient earth in order to allow for the immense amount of time required for evolutionary processes to work, the majority of scientists had abandoned the Usher chronology truth. Usher's chronology was largely abandoned until the 20th century rise of young earth creationism, which supports the idea that the Bible provides a factually accurate account of the world's history. Young earth creationists, a part of the wider creationist movement, still believe that Usher's dates are close to correct. It's taken derived from Wikipedia under Usher Lightfoot Calendar. Now, it's interesting that they talk about, oh, this young creationist, it's, a, it's an Americana thing. It's an American thing. No, goes back even before evolution. Nice try. Age of the earth, the defining characteristics of the creationist belief is that the earth is young. Amen. The earth is young because God created the heaven and earth in how many days? How many days did he create heaven and earth, Stephen? Seven. Well, yes. Six days. Six days and he rested the, the seventh. Seven. Yeah. That's it. Um, so we see that on the young, uh, the earth is young on the order of six to 10,000 years. I mean, I'm not going to split hairs, folks. If we can agree between six to 10,000 years, wow, we're really making progress. Mm -hmm. Rather than the age of 4.5 billion years estimated by a variety of scientific methods, right? Including radiometric dating. Young Earth creationists, YEC, typically derive the range of figures using the ages given in the genealogies and other dates in the Bible, similar to the process used by James Usher, 1581 to 1656. It's an owner's manual, folks. What an amazing blessing of what these great men did. They used their intellect to delve deep into the Word of God and to give us these great landmarks. YEC, or Young Earth Creationists, believe that life was created by God, each after their kind in the universe's first six normal length 24-hour days. Additionally, they believe that the biblical account of Noah's flood is historically true, maintaining that there was a worldwide flood approximately 2,349 B.C., that destroyed all terrestrial life except that which was saved on Noah's Ark. This uh, global, or we can say worldwide flood, is thought to be responsible for the multitude of geological features that mainstream science regards as evidence of an old earth. Young earth creationists believe that the great flood described in Genesis 6 through 9 
was worldwide in extent and submerged the highest mountains on earth, a range of suggestions are made to account for the mechanism for such a deluge. Earlier generations following the lead of Morris and Whitcomb believe that an orbiting vapor canopy collapsed, generating extreme rainfall from the windows of heaven. In more recent times, it has been proposed that radical geological activity, the opening of the fountains of the Great Deep, was largely responsible for the flood. Elaborate theories such as catastrophic <coughs> plate tectonics and hydroplates have been put forward by some. Now we see that the vapor canopy suggests a layer of water vapor in the upper, upper atmosphere which, triggered by God, caused a giant rain, rain shower and so contributed to the flood. <coughs> so we see there's a lot of theories here, folks, but if you get into Genesis chapter 1, talks about water above the firmament and water below the firmament. We're going to get into more defining what heaven, heaven equals firmament, and firmament is a, a solid surface. And there's water above, above it, and there's water below it. And water came down, <clears throat> and, 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 and water came from the bottom. Okay? We're surrounded by water. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are water. Mm -hmm. They're oceans. I mean, water is so important. And so, therefore, we can actually ask, answer the question, the age-old question, why is the sky blue? Because there's water above it. And you say, well, 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 all the water came out. Look, there's time mentioned in the Psalms, a thousand or fifteen hundred years later, David's talking about water above firmament, water in heaven, and water below the heavens. I digress. Let me get back into it. These theories have the added benefit of explaining how the flood transformed an originally flatter earth, amen, raising up mountains and dropping seabeds. This then solves the problem of finding sufficient water to cover Mount Everest. Whatever the cause, almost all young earth creationists refer to a loosely codified idea called flood geology to argue that the vast majority of present day geological features are the result of the great flood. To support their belief in a worldwide flood, young earth creationists argue that anthropological evidence supports their belief that every culture studied has, in its history, a myth or story similar to that of Noah in two aspects. Number one, the occurrence of a catastrophic flood, and number two, human and animal life saved by a man who built a large boat and took abroad it for the duration of the flood enough life to repopulate the earth. Yes! History records a worldwide flood found in every culture. But why would scientists today want to go back and study history? This is history. It's an historical event. It's a significant historical event. Because there are giants. And there are giants found all over. But it's a cover-up. Oh, that's a conspiracy. Oh, it's a confederacy, folks. Oh, it's a conspiracy theory. I'll call it a confederacy. It's the governments of this earth that are in league and confederate against Almighty God. Mm -hmm. Psalm 2. To support their belief in a worldwide flood. All right, so we see that the occurrence of the catastrophic flood and human animal life, animal life saved by a man who built a large boat and took abroad it for the duration of the flood enough life to repopulate the earth. According to Genesis, two of every unclean kind of animal, male and female, and seven of every clean kind of animal were placed on the ark during the flood. After the flood, Genesis reports increasingly shortened lifespans dropped quickly, dropping quickly from an average of 900 years at the time of Noah to an average of 100 by the time of Abraham. One theory suggests that the earth had a higher concentration of oxygen prior to the flood, possibly due to a layer of water vapor, vapor canopy, above the earth. Remember, there was a dew going on in the Garden of Eden, but there wasn't, it didn't rain. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was more of a tropical. I don't know. I wasn't there. Now, the result of such a postulation would be a giant hyper hyperbaric chamber. Well, that's very good for you, by the way. 
uh, oxygen H to cells of your body. I digress, extending lifespans. Yet others theorize that the firmament of the waters above screen the earth from harmful ultraviolet uh, rays, which they argue shorten life expectancy. All right, so this is uh, taken and derived from Wikipedia under Young Earth Creationism. Now, flood geology. Flood geology, also creation geology or diluvial geology, is a prominent subset of beliefs under the umbrella of creation science that explains the literal truth of a worldwide flood as described in Genesis account of Noah's Ark. For adherents, the worldwide flood and its aftermath is believed to be the origin of most of the Earth's geological features, including sedimentary strata, fossilization, fossil fuels, submarine canyons, salt domes, and frozen mammoths. Yes, frozen mammoths where they add their food still in their mouth and they're like flash frozen. Okay. As such, flood geology is in direct opposition to human scientific disciplines such as geology, evolutionary biology, biology, and paleontology. Most young earth creationists regard Genesis as proving a, a, a historically and scientifically accurate record for the geological history of the earth and also believe that there exists evidence that can back up to the her historicity of the flood. This is accomplished in flood geology, which was developed as a creationist endeavor in the 20th century by George McCready Price, a Seventh-day Adventist and geologist who wrote The New Geology in 1923 to provide an explicitly Christian fundamental perspective on geology. His work was updated and uh, adapted by Henry M. Morris and John C. Whitcomb Jr. in their book, The Genesis Flood in 1961. Morris and Whitcomb argue that the earth was geologically recent and that the fall of man had triggered the second law of thermodynamics. We'll pick it up next time. Jesus loves you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Bye.